And now I'd like to, um, to introduce the Holistic Life Foundation to you guys. And I'm uh, really delighted to be, to be on, the, on the stage with these guys and be able to introduce them. And so just, just very, very briefly, because these guys are going to tell you the story, but um, uh, the Holistic Life Foundation have been around for 12, 13 years now. Mm -hmm. I'm working with um, people of all ages, actually, in Baltimore. But a lot of the work is focused on, on, on young kids and young people, and especially young people from some of the most kind of at-risk um, uh, communities, you know, um, coming from really challenging backgrounds. So it's uh, really delighted that these guys could come here, because I think the challenges that, you know, the Holistic Life Foundation people face in Baltimore are not probably too dissimilar to what we face uh, in communities in this, this part of the world. Um, so if we could again put our hands together for the Holistic Life Foundation. All right, so um, we're gonna start off kind of the way we start a lot of our classes and when we go into places, whether it is schools or drug rehab centers or mental health facilities, we always focus on the breath. And Michael had mentioned the breath earlier as well. And, and it's just something that we always say is so, so essential and so important because you carry it with you all the time. It's something that's always with you. We like to use this metaphor when we teach the breath and we say that our, the, the lives that we live, it's like the ocean. And our body is a boat. And sometimes that ocean can be kind of hectic. You know, you have friends, you have your parents, you have your children, you have the media, society, your thoughts, your emotions, and that can make the waters push your boat around. And your breath is that anchor that stills you. That no matter what the scenario is in life, that when you return to your breath and you go inward and you use that breath, that it can calm those waters again, and then you can set your sails and go in whatever direction you'd like to go. So we're just gonna take a few deep breaths today, but before we do, I'm gonna just tell you a few ways. So we're gonna do all the breathing in and out of our noses, okay? It's amazing, uh, 12 years now we've been doing this work, and whenever I go, when we go places, we start and we say, all right, we're gonna teach y'all how to breathe. And everyone looks at us like, well, I've been doing that for a while, you know, I think I got it. And uh, a lot of people breathe in properly. So always in and out of our noses. Any of y'all in here have uh, babies, children? Children, see babies, yeah. So infants, when you look at an infant, it breathes perfectly. It's always in and out of its nose. And when it inhales, you see the belly rise, and you see the belly fall. Even if it's, we always joke around, even if they have snot in their nose, they still are forcing it, and you see the little snot bubble come out, you know what I mean? No matter what, it's always in and out the nose. But as we get older, what happens? We start breathing like animals. It's almost like a panting. It's a And you're not getting enough oxygen in your body, which means you're not cleaning out your blood, you're not helping yourself with digestion. But also that exhale is extremely important as well because there's a direct correlation to those thoughts, those ruminating thoughts that are in your mind all day. Oh, did I leave the oven on? I gotta take care of this. Don't forget about this, I got, I got this. And your head's just racing all day long and that's because you're not fully exhaling. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take 10 nice deep breaths today together, but we're really gonna focus on the belly. So the way we do it so that you can focus on your belly is you're gonna put your hand on your belly and you can watch me first. When you inhale, you're going to inhale and I'm going to push my belly out. So watch, I'm inhaling. <clears throat> belly gets big, right? Leave your hand there and when you exhale, pull your belly away from your hand. <sighs> and create that space. So we're really focusing on using all of our lungs. So it would be an inhale again. <clears throat> exhale it all out. <sighs> oh, your breath sounds good. All right, so now we're going to all do it together with the same technique. If you, if you like and you feel comfortable, you're welcome to close your eyes and use your imagination too and see that healing oxygen coming into your body with every inhale. And with every exhale, push out all that stress, anxiety that you have in your body, okay? So everyone together, nice big deep breath in. Inhale deep through your nose. Exhale, pull your belly away from your hand. Inhale deep. Exhale it out. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. All that healing oxygen. Exhale. All your stress and thoughts. Inhale. 
Exhale. Let's do two more together. Inhale deep. Exhale. Last one. Inhale deep. Exhale it out. And before you open your eyes, just take three deep breaths on your own. Do what we like to call an internal assessment. Take note of how your mind feels. Take note of how your body feels. And then when you're done, you can slowly, slowly blink your eyes open and come back to your senses. So the history of the Holistic Life Foundation. Um, so this picture in the top corner is uh, Atman and I when we were little kids. I'm the one in the weird looking denim outfit. atman has got the green hoodie on. So uh, we grew up in West Baltimore. Anybody familiar with The Wire, the HBO series? So like a lot of those series, a lot of those places that they film in that show are where we grew up. Um, so it's like the early 80s ish when we were growing up there. Uh, before crack hit really hard, it was a beautiful community, um, big family. We spent as much time at our neighbor's house as we did as ours. Um, all of our friends, we went outside and played with them all the time, Little League Baseball, all the fun stuff of growing up in a community. Um, but there was like, a, like this deep secret that we kind of kept from everybody was the fact that we were like meditators. Like our parents were real heavily into yoga and meditation when we were born. Um, we were vegan growing up. Uh, now all that stuff is cool, but back then we just got made fun of for it, so we didn't tell anybody. Um, so our dad had us meditate every morning before school, and he set the base, I guess, for, for what we're doing now. Um, we were into it a lot. Some of we were into it most of the time. Other times we just try to make the other person laugh to get him in trouble with our dad. But, I mean, it was there, and we were practicing. Um, they sent us to a Quaker school, so we went to Friends School of Baltimore, which had a meeting for worship, which, had, which was its own mindfulness practice unto itself. Um, so it was just like that base was set early, but it was just something that we kept to ourselves. Uh, we meditated with each other. We talked about it with each other. We talked about it with our dad. Uh, we also actually grew up in a self-realization fellowship church, like a book autobiography of a yogi. Anybody read that one? Great book, if you haven't read it. Uh, so we grew up in a church like that. So church started with a meditation. And I remember Atman and I, the first time went to our, our, grandparents, our dad's parents' church, uh, they didn't start with the meditations. We were looking at each other kind of weirded out by the fact that they didn't start church with the meditation. So it was just one of those things we grew up with. And um, as we got older, our parents split up. And um, so it was kind of like them having two households. There wasn't the opportunity to kind of stick with the practice. So it was just kind of our practice faded away. We still went to school. We went to church every once in a while. So we meditated every once in a while, but it just wasn't as regular. Um, so then we fast forward to, uh, oh, and the picture in the middle is our parents' teacher, um, he was uh, from South America, good dude. We used to go to all these ashrams, like yoga retreats growing up, because there were a ton of them between Baltimore, Washington, D.C., and like uh, Philly, so they would travel around, and this was just something that was a part of our lives. Um, fast forward to college, we met Andy partying in college. Um, we would hang out at house parties and bars, and we'd see him there all the time. And I, went, we I went to class, too, by the way. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> uh, so, but that was when we met him. Like, we didn't have any, like, we were all had different majors, so we didn't really see each other on campus in the classroom setting. But we did see each other at the bars and the house parties, and we started talking. And we saw, we saw the world in a lot, the ways in, that were similar. Like, we saw a lot of suffering. We saw a lot of things going on that could be changed, but no one was really doing anything about it. So, um, I don't know, it was just, it, it led to us starting, our, our partying shifted from a partying into a book club. We're not really sure how it happened, but there's this huge shift from us being out of the bar to us sitting around in my bed, in my room at my, at my condo I lived on, in it, or at Ottman's living room. We'd have these big stacks of books. We would go to the school libraries and we'd get books on environmental science and ancient history and spirituality and religion and astronomy and astrology. And we share all these passages with each other. <laughs> And um, it got to a point where we were like, okay, we see all these problems in the world, what are we going to do about it? We need to try something. So then we saw this dude right here, Matthew Lesko. Uh, he's big in the States. He has these, uh, he looks like the Riddler with the question marks on his jacket. And he has all these commercials, like these infomercials, like, what can the government do for you? The government pay for you to start a business or write a book or do this or do that. And he has all this grant money. So our, I guess our brilliant idea at the time was we were going to, um, the government was going to pay for us to save the world. Like that was our... <laughs> 
yeah, it's, yeah, it sounded like a good idea at the time, but it sounds really <laughs> ridiculous saying it now, but that was what we were going to do. The government was going to pay for us to save the world, so we went to um, like Yahoo or Ask Jeeves at the time. There was no Google back then, so we went to that search engine, looked up all these grants. We found this EPA grant uh, for ground-level ozone detection, and we were going to use that grant to uh, show people how bad the air was in Baltimore and then use the rest of that to fund other programs. And we had it all planned out. We was getting, it was like for like $250,000 grant, something ridiculous like that. So we printed it out, we started filling it out, and uh, we saw that the government doesn't give hundreds of thousands of dollars to three college students with a good idea. So we had to start a nonprofit. So um, we shelved that whole government paying us to save the world idea for a little while, and we got deep into our practice. Me and Atman's godfather, our dad's best friend, was one of those people that got into like meditation and yoga and contemplative practices in like the late 60s, and uh, he never got out of it. We always tease him and say he was like Yoda, just sitting there waiting for us to come find him, and we, he, and he started teaching us. He told us, uh, showed up one morning, not one day, knocked on his door. We hung out with him. Actually, we used to hang out with him all the time, but it was like uh, he told us, he was like, if you guys were really serious about learning, two things. One... You guys have to agree to be teachers, and two, you have to um, agree to come over tomorrow morning at four to start learning. It's four in the morning, so showed up at his door at four in the morning, knocked on the door, we started learning, we kept learning, we kept learning. We're still learning to this day, but it was a long process, and we got really deep into our practice. So as we were getting back into our practice, we moved back to the neighborhood we grew up in, and, and uh, this is after crack had hit really hard. It was a shell of itself. Like, people weren't, there weren't any neighbors. It was kind of people living by themselves and kind of existing by themselves, and not, there was no interaction between people boarded up houses, open air drug markets, um, huge violence problem, gang problem, heroin crack, like it was, it was a total shell of itself. And uh, we moved back in, we got deeper into our practice and um, we decided that we were gonna start that nonprofit. So we went search engine, print out a list, a checklist of what you needed to do to start a nonprofit in the state of Maryland. Started going down the checklist. I remember we found the name Holistic Life Foundation because my dad had this huge thesaurus sitting in his, uh, library, our office, and uh, we um, started looking through it. We've Holistic pop stuck out to us in life because we want to deal with people's lives and put foundation on it because we thought at the time that all nonprofits had the word foundation in the name. So <laughs> we were the Holistic Life Foundation. And so we had a nonprofit, we had our practice, but we didn't have anything going on in our lives. Those are the only two things we had. All right. Um... We do a lot of traveling, and when we do travel, we love to connect with the people. And we connected with some people at this fine establishment called Neeson's uh, when we first got here. <laughs> and um, talking to them, it made us realize that uh, in Scotland, they're dealing with a lot of the same issues that we're dealing with in Baltimore. And Sir Harry, he just reinforced it even more, uh, you know, with, like Ali was saying, uh, we did grow up in a place where it was a sense of community. like. Uh, they call our neighborhoods hoods because they say all the neighbors moved out. It's that not, not that neighbor, that community feeling. And hearing Sir Harry talk, I'm like, man, it's, they're going through the exact same things that we're going through in, in the States. And as you can see in Baltimore, Baltimore is the blue line. Um, well, Maryland is the red line and the United States is the green line. And as you can see, in Baltimore, we're faced with a lot of hardships. Um, and one thing that I can say is that uh, through the 13 years of us doing the work in Baltimore, that we've changed our community. And the way that we've done that is our teaching style is uh, reciprocal teaching. We teach the kids how to be teachers. And we don't really, it's not really that uh, the parents don't really support their kids in school too much. So it's really hard to do like a uh, parent outreach and kind of affect them and make, it, make the um, mindfulness practice go home with them. Uh, but they actually are teachers and they bring the uh, practice back home to their parents. And it's crazy, like uh, Andy and I, we always are walking, I'm walking my dogs in the neighborhood, Ollie's, uh, Andy's always working out. And people ask us, they stop and ask us like, uh, hey yoga man, uh, can uh, meditation stop me from s smoking cigarettes? Or they ask us random questions. And before when we first moved back into our neighborhood, it was kind of like the wild west. And you really couldn't look anybody in the eyes. Uh, just because you know people that people weren't friendly, you know, and yeah, and one thing that we've seen is through the mindfulness practice and teaching kids how to be teachers that we're changing the community from the inside out. So, like I've been said, um, Sir Harry hit it perfectly. Where this is what our kids are going through. These are all the ch the, the, the challenges that they face. Um, I mean, there's these kids that are four years old that'll come in and. I'll go to their class that day and I'm trying to lead a mindfulness class 
and I can't really do the scheduled class because all they're talking about is the dead body that they found in the back of their school, or their uncle that got shot, or their best friend that got stabbed in the head that day. You know, th these kids don't have anything but just this craziness, and it's, it's amazing to us because it's like PTSD. You know, they're living in a war zone. That's their neighborhood. And, and you know, Sarhei was saying, like, look at what happens to these kids when they get there, when they're not getting the hugs. They're not getting the I love yous. They're not getting that support from their, not only their community, but their families. And these are the kids that we like to go out and really impact and to make that difference. And we know it's possible, because like Ottman said, that's what we've been doing. In that neighborhood that I moved into with them, I was kind of sticking out as the way I looked. As you can see how they look and then how I look. So I was kind of the oddball. They either thought I was a police officer or I was there to get drugs, basically, for the first like six years. That's all they ever asked me. It was, hey, what you need? You need some drugs? You need some drugs? Or they look at me with that look like, what precinct do you work at, officer? And I'm like, I live right there. You see me every single day. You know what I mean? But that's the neighborhood that we're living in. That's the, that's the, the culture and, and, and the challenges that we face. And one thing that we're really big about is that love. You know, and I love that he ended it, his last speech with that compassion and the love. Because we say I love you to everyone all the time. It's, we always say it's the most powerful force in the universe. And, and, and in our neighborhood, love is like a bad word. You know, there was a time where Ali was on the porch and there's a kid who, um, he was a knucklehead, we're in a rec center, and he decides in the rec center in the middle of the lobby while we're waiting to get our passes scanned to smoke some weed in the lobby of the rec center. And we're like, what an idiot, come on, buddy. Like, he wants to, she wanted to show off for his friends. So the next day on the porch, all the other kids are like, we need to get rid of him. We gotta get him out of the program. He's gonna get us kicked out the Y. He's not thinking about us, he's thinking about himself. And Ali's like, nah, we can't kick him out. We love him. And all the kids are like, ew, like, you can't say that. And we were like, what do you mean? And we were like describing to them what love really is. And it's to now, you know, we've been working with this group of kids and we'll go further with how they are now. Every one of the kids we work with, when they get off the phone with us, they say, all right, man, see you later. I love you. And these are some pretty tough kids. And they say it in front of all their guys who are hustling on the streets and who are gang members. And they still say, I love you. And if they don't say it, they'll call us back, like, hey, my bad, man, I love you. And I hang it <laughs> no joke, it's crazy. I mean, even we have scenarios where it would te you know, it'll be the first day at school, and we have an after-school program, and it'll be a new parent that comes in and brings their little kid, and the, and the parent leaves, and I'm like, all right, see you later, I love you. And she'll look at me like, who the hell are you? I don't even know who you, I love you, what? But later on, every day, you just keep beating it into them, I love you, see you later, I love you. They all say I love you back eventually. I don't have any children on Father's Day. I get tons of text messages say Happy Father's Day from all the parents in our program because they know that we're there for the kids and we're spreading that love. All right, so our after school program. So um, our after school program kind of started by mistake. Uh, Annie and I used to pick my mom up from school that she worked at every day. It's an elementary school. And they didn't have any, um, pretty much they didn't have any males working at the school at all. Um, other than maybe a few people on the custodial staff. So the principal approached us and was like, hey, how would you guys like to work with some of my fifth graders? Uh, maybe you guys coach football or something. And um, we didn't really want to teach kids football. I mean, we, we love football, don't get this wrong. American football, we love American football. <laughs> um, so, I mean, we love it, we're big fans, but we didn't, that's not where we wanted to go with it. So we went home for the weekend, kind of thought about it, we're like, let's do an after school, like mindfulness and yoga program, let's see what happens. And I went back to the principal, she pitched, we pitched it to her and she was like, cool, whatever you guys are gonna do, fine. Um, and it was funny, because they stuck us in the back of the school. We could have been doing anything with that group of kids, because they put us like way in the back of the school, so no one ever came back there, we never saw anyone, so it was just like us and a group of 15 kids. It turns out she gave us a 15 kind of worst students, uh, the kids that were always in detention, the kids that were always fighting, the kids that were always suspended, uh, the kids that would curse out their teachers, we got all of them. Um, for the most part, other than Justin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so other than one, other than one whose behavior had to improve a little bit before he joined our program, we got all of them at the school. So um, we went in, we set up our mats. I remember the first day we had, was, we had never taught a yoga class or med, taught anyone meditation, taught anyone any mindfulness practices. We walked in the room, the kids walked in, they saw the mats and they screamed WrestleMania and started beating each other up on the mats. <laughs> No joke, so we looked at each other and we were like, we shouldn't be doing this, we picked the wrong profession, we need to get out of here, and um, yeah, that was, that was our first day. So finally, after the kids calmed down, we got them to breathe, and they started to center themselves, and we were like, okay, well maybe this is going to work, and uh, we were with them every day, so we didn't really see the change in them too much. I think we noticed the change when we were picking up 
less and less kids from detention. Like, we start off the first day, had to pick up, like, two-thirds of the kids, and it was half, then it was, like, maybe one or two, then it was none, and everyone was there. And then uh, the parents and the teachers used to come up to us, and they'd be like, hey, whatever you guys are, like I said, no one came back there and checked on us. They would say to us, whatever you guys are doing with those kids, keep doing it because they're changing. So we, we stuck with them. We stuck with that group. Our program expanded. Um, started with 15. Now we're at about 90 students, uh, pre-K through fifth. We started with all boys because uh, that was easier on us um, when we were first starting. But now it's a co-ed program, pre-K through fifth. So we have three-year-olds up to, uh, I guess, 11. It's probably the oldest student. And um, five days a week, um, it's a great program. We love it. They do the daily mindfulness and yoga practice. We do enrichment programs, environmental programs, art. Uh, some cool field trips. Uh, we have guest speakers come in. It's grown from us three trying to do everything to a staff of six people. So things are slowly growing and progressing. Um, and now we're at a school. We started off at, a, at the elementary school. We went to the YMCA, and now we're back in elementary school to have a greater connection with the teachers. But it's usually our training ground for our, our teachers. Like I'm saying with the reciprocal teaching model, like if you all are ever in the States, you want to come visit our after-school program, you're, you're definitely welcome. welcome. Too. Please, please Seriously. come visit. Yeah. Um, but if you walk in the room, you won't see us leading anyone through a breath or a meditation. It'll be the kids leading people through it. So you'll walk in, you'll see like a little four-year-old in the front of the room leading everyone through a breath or a second grader leading everyone through a guided meditation or a fourth grader doing some mindful walking. So they're all the teachers, so we get them early. And like I was saying, that's how we get the practice back into the house. Um, I remember the first time we realized it, uh, this young girl that we did a TEDx talk down in Charlottesville, this young girl that presents with us, and uh, she was the first one person that we realized with the practice of leaking back into the house because her mom would come home stressed. And, you know, I mean, mom's coming home stressed. She's going to scream at the, the easiest person to let it out on. And she sat her mom down and she's like, Mom, look, sit down. I'm going to show you how to breathe and meditate. She sat her mom down, showed her how to breathe and meditate, calmed everything down, and mom came back in and told us the next day. So that was when we realized, like, okay, maybe this is really working. Like, we teach them to be teachers. They're empowered by the practice. They own it then they're going to spread it to other people. <clears throat> All right. Um, so after the kids uh, got out of the after-school program, we kind of formed an informal uh, mentoring program, uh, basically so they could have somebody in their lives that uh, cared about them and they could reach out to, because our numbers never change. We stay in the same houses that we grew up in, so they can reach out to us. And uh, the one thing that we noticed with us is that we kind of held them accountable. Like everyone in their lives, they really didn't care about letting them down, but we held them to a high standard, so they held themselves to a high standard. And in doing that, these guys kind of uh, are breaking the boundaries down on what it means to be a young black man from Baltimore City. Uh, as you can see, um, what's it called? 19 out of 20 of them went to college or working full time. 19 or 20 of them uh, graduated from high school. Uh, none of them incarcerated, and all of them still have that yoga practice or mindfulness practice. So, like, uh, just the accountability and being there, being that support for these kids have helped them out besides the mindfulness practice. The mindfulness practice gives them that inner peace and the way to be present and deal with the chaos that they deal with in their lives. But, you know, having that accountability kind of made them strive at a lot higher level than their peers. And they're all leaders amongst their peers. Yeah, and another thing about the mindfulness practice, I think it gave them that sense of connection. So they got connected to themselves first and then their communities, then everything. So like their scope went from my reality is my neighborhood to my reality is the entire planet. So we've had kids that have gone to college all over the country. They dream of traveling. We had one kid that did a documentary in China. So their, their scope and their worldview has gone from the couple square blocks that are in the neighborhood to the entire planet. And it helps them, like I'm saying, reach and achieve at a higher level. So it got to where, um, this is our workforce development, it got to where people kept saying, we, we need to clone you. You know, we, we need more of you guys. You know, the three of y'all can't keep doing this yourselves. And that's why we're in Scotland. They're going to clone us <laughs> while we're here. Like, <laughs> 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 that would be really nice. No. Um, so <laughs> it got to where we're sitting there and we see these young gentlemen that are in our mentoring program and they've had the practice. You know, they've been doing it for eight, nine years at that point. And we're like, well, we already got our clones. It's these guys. So we wanted to train them more. So what we did was we would take them up into the mountains in North Carolina. It's a beautiful place we went to. It was a cabin in the, up in the hills, yet it's away from everything. And no electricity, so there's no phones. They're not just staring at their phones all day. That's all they did. There's no electricity, no internet. We had to get um, some spring water, so we just had like a gallon of water. They, did, they had to shower outside. They slept in tents. It was a complete change for them. 
And all we did was mindfulness and yoga practices for the whole week. And it transformed these guys. You know, it was amazing for them to see what was going on with them. And it was so cool for us to watch because we were watching them with the books look just like us, the way we were when the three of us were in a circle, like, oh man, look how awesome this is, or look how neat this is. And they were doing the same thing and taking notes and we could see them growing and becoming other versions of us. And I think it really hit, hit home when one time we had to go get more supplies. You had to drive like 30 minutes down the mountain. And one of the gentlemen goes and they go into this Walmart so Walmart's like a huge superstore. Do y'all know what a Walmart is? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if y'all. This is like a super Walmart. Like though. super, like, like ginormous, right? Like, and the one kid walks in, and part of my language is what he says. He says, why, why do we need all this shit? That's what he said. <laughs> it, it blew his mind because he couldn't believe the way we were living and the peace and the quiet and the stillness. And then to come down there and just see all this and like, what is, what is all this for? And it was amazing. We're driving back to the city and you could see all their energy is kind of like, ah, oh, we're getting back into Baltimore, and the first thing you see is a guy getting arrested on the side of the street, and it's just like, all of them like, we want to go back in the woods. We should go, we want to go back. Can we go back in the woods? You know what I mean? So you can see the numbers, it's been amazing. So it was the three of us, a year later, we had four other teachers with us. After that, 17 new teachers. And these are the kids that were in that first program, a large portion of them, over half of them work at our program, work at that same after school program that we started with them. Now they're the ones leading it. We have kids that are, they graduated from amazing schools, could be anything they want to. And what do they do? They come back to us and they say, you know what, I wanna work with you guys. Because I wouldn't be the man I am today if it wasn't for that program. And, and I apologize if I was kind of a butthead when I was there or was just you know, pushing back, but I noticed that I'm using what you all taught me in my life all the time. You know, a lot of them say, they usually say three things. The ones that didn't go to college say, I would either be a drug dealer, I would be in jail, or I would be dead if it wasn't for you guys. And they want to come back and be the ones that make that difference in their neighborhoods. And that's our whole goal is we're teaching teachers. We're, we're trying to go out there and find kids and no matter where it is and teach them how to teach their neighborhoods. You know, we all want to be Glaswegians, by the way, okay, so. <laughs> totally. But we don't, know, we don't have it all down, you know? We don't know the slang or the dress and stuff like that. So if I come into a school, I mean, we're still pretty cool guys, so we're gonna get it, get it through, but it'd be better to go and teach the locals and get them to learn the practices so that they can go and impact their neighborhoods, so they can feel empowered enough to say, this is my neighborhood. I don't want it to be like this. I'm, I'm making an improvement to it. And that's what our whole goal is. We're always teaching the teacher. And it's amazing the way it's worked. It's just been, it's, it's a, I mean, I get excited just talking about it. Goodness gracious, yeah. Yeah, the program he's talking about, we started in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, where U University of Virginia is. Um, it's kind of like we go in and, and we, we worked at the Boys and Girls Club and then found 18 to 24 year olds that weren't kind of engaged in anything but had a lot of skills and a lot of energy, or not a lot of skills, but a lot of talent and a lot of energy. And um, so we went into the Boys and Girls Club and we taught for a while, like we really got ourselves entrenched there and showed them the benefits of mindfulness, made it look cool since it was an out, some outsiders coming in. And then we left two of our staff there, uh, two of our younger teachers that had gone through our workforce development program for the summer, we left them there. And then we would come back down, we trained 11 young teachers, um, 18 to 24 year olds, and then we left them down there. And now they're teaching at the Boys and Girls Club, we're working on getting them into some schools because I mean, one of our things, we always think that like the best solutions are homegrown solutions. Like we can give them the skills, but someone that's from that area that knows the area and is really passionate about it, like Andy was saying, give them the right skills, they can use their energy in a positive way to make a huge change, actually. All right, so some of the um, cool things our workforce development students have done, um, they've gone to uh, teach with us in Madison, Wisconsin. We do a residency program there. This is all the stuff that's on here, but uh, some of the coolest things that they've done, I think, have been, uh, they spent the entire summer at a university. The first time we sent them off was to Bloomsburg University in Pennsylvania, and we sent two students. They taught a lot in the city. They'd never been on their own, really, and uh, we sent them up there, and they taught like 800 incoming college freshmen for the entire summer, and they were kind of nervous about it at first. We kept kind of reinforcing them, like, you guys got this, you guys got this, and they went up there, and they had the highest rated enrichment program of the entire summer, so they're really happy about that. Um, we've sent a couple to Germany. Um, we've sent, they've been all over the place and they're awesome teachers. I think the, the main thing with them was just getting the confidence to go out and teach. Um, and I mean, I guess that's with anybody. I guess that was with us too, but just kind of 
being comfortable in your own skin and comfortable with your practice enough to kind of go out there and share it with others. So um, we've, we've got a lot of big plans. We've got 10 new schools we got to go into in Baltimore and a couple other places. So we'll have to do another huge training this summer, probably get around 25 new teachers we're hoping for. So yeah, it's been a good process. All right, the Mindful Moment program. Uh, it's one of our initiatives that we started last year um, where it's actually during the school day uh, the school gives us 15 minutes at the beginning of the day, 15 minutes at the end of the day for a mindfulness practice that's played over the loudspeaker. Um, and, you know, we just do that at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day. We catch them at the beginning of the day to kind of, if they're dealing with any trauma at home, it kind of gets them, gets that trauma or those ruminating thoughts that Andy was talking about out of their mind so they can be present and actually learn while they're in school. And then at the end of the day to kind of reinforce that mindfulness practice so if they're going back to a traumatic situation, they will have that, those tools and that inner peace already inside of them. Um, and besides the 15-minute uh, practice at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, we have an alternative to suspension room uh, where if kids get in trouble or if they just have too many thoughts on their mind, they're depressed, angry, uh, they can either self-refer themselves or the teachers can refer them to this room. We have four of our staff members uh, staffing the room and it's pretty cool because we have like a, a oil diffuser in there. So people just like, even if they're not mad, they may just come into the room and just be like, ah, and you know, just get that smell, get that fragrance in them and it kind of calm them down. Um, but the um, protocol for the room is, you know, they, the kids come in, they sign in, uh, they sit and breathe with our, um, do some mindful breathing with our staff members. Uh, we, make, we make them some tea, we talk to them a little bit, and then we do another mindfulness practice and you know, just get them in a better mood and then send them back to class. And you know, the program has been going well. Um, and like I said, this is the second year of uh, the initiative. So we have this new program where we train 10% of uh, the students uh, to be mindful ambassadors where they're actually taking the practice into the classroom and to their peers. And you know, once again, that whole reciprocal teaching model because we're not going to be there the whole time. They'll be with their peers a lot more than we will. So, you know, we're just trying to infuse as much mindfulness into the school culture as possible. And it's pretty cool. Like, uh, when we first went into the school, it was, like, known for, like, riots and fights. And, like, online, you know, if you search the school that we're at, you'll see, like, it was, like, one of the biggest riots in Baltimore at that school. And, you know, through you know, the mindfulness practice and the different initiatives that we're doing at the school, you know, a lot of positive changes we're seeing in the school. Uh, like, the most amount of freshmen got promoted uh, last year, um, less fights at the end of the year, less referrals. So, you know, everything that the principals want to see, they want the numbers in the states, they're seeing it. So, you know, it's, and one thing that, that I can give you all advice for is when, you're, when you are trying to go into the school, always make sure you have that champion principal uh, because they can make sure that your program goes over. If you don't have a principal that's on board, it makes it an uphill battle. And then also one thing that we've noticed uh, is you have to really get the teachers on board as well because they can be one of your biggest stumbling blocks because uh, I remember last year uh, before we did our teacher outreach, you know, we met, um, you know, some resistance uh, just because they didn't see what the, why do we need to be teaching these kids, taking 15 minutes out of my instructional time to teach kids how to breathe. And they finally understand that taking those 15 minutes, even though it's taking those 15 minutes away, it's adding that much more, uh, the kids are that much more present and they can absorb that much more information in the remaining time that they have. So it's really, you know, taking a mindfulness program into the school, starting off selling the principal and then sell uh, the teachers and the students, they'll feel the practice. So, you know, it'll, they'll be easy sell. But the program is going awesome and, you know, we're expanding it to another school next year as well. So see, here are some of the numbers that uh, Atman was talking about that we got from the teacher survey. And uh, again, it goes back to that love thing too, I think, that we were talking about earlier, that um, we really try to deal with the student completely. So the culture in the school is transforming. An example would be there is a day that one of our staff members is walking down the hall, it's in between classes, and uh, there's a young gentleman, he's roaming the halls. It always happens in that school, they're just out and about, they're not in class, surprise, surprise. So one day, uh, he sees a guy and he's like, all he says to him is, hey, good morning, how you doing? And the kid says, fuck you, man, what you talking about? And he's like, what? <laughs> so he walks over to him too. He's like, he, I remember him telling me, Andy, the streets almost came out of me. I swear I was gonna give him something, right? But then he says, 
you know what, man? He's like, you need to, you need to come with me and I'm gonna show you what I'm doing. Why don't you come with me? So he comes and he takes him to that room, that mindful moment room. And the kid looks at it and he's like, nah, I'm not into this. And he's like, well, hey, you know, this is what we're here for. Anytime you're feeling kind of like you were just feeling today when you, when you confronted me like that, come on over here. I got you, you know, for whatever you need. So the next day the kid comes back and he's like, hey, can I talk to you for a second? And my buddy's like, yeah, I told you you can come here anytime. And he closes the door behind him and he just starts crying. This is one of the toughest kids in school, just crying. He's like, man, my uncle just died. All the kids are making fun. I can't wash my clothes. No one will help me wash my clothes. I'm hungry. I mean, what am I supposed to do? You know what I mean? And, uh, and our, 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 our staff member there, he, that's what he went through. You know, his home was, his, his childhood was, uh, was a mess. It was a mess. So he's like, I've been through your struggles. He told him, you know what you need to do? Come here, bring me all your clothes. I'll wash your clothes for you. You know, you need some food, I'll get some food for you, whatever. Now, again, I'm not saying for you all when there's someone with an issue that you're going to be washing all your students' clothes or washing, you know, <laughs> or giving them food and stuff like that. But just the fact that we would, we're always about whatever it takes, you know, no matter what, that's what we're here for. And that's part of the practice. You know, uh, 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 something we say is this mindfulness stuff and this yoga stuff, it's not something you do. It's something you are. It's a part of your whole day. You know, you can get on a yoga mat and do physical exercises and meditate for an hour, but you have 23 hours left in your day. And what are you doing then? And that's what we're about is showing them that it's about the whole child, the whole person, and really listening to them and knowing where they're coming from and just being there for them. And that's what's so important. And the results have shown that it's been effective. And yeah, these are some of the stats I was talking about with suspensions going down. Um, Fights going down, uh, GPA went up for the freshman class, the promotions for the freshman class went up. So, And this was just the first, like, we weren't sure what was going to happen the first year of this program. Uh, we didn't even think we were going to get results like this because we just went in and did the work and things didn't look a whole lot different, actually. I mean, some of the, you could see some of the kids felt a little better, but actually talking to the principal and when he gave us the stats, he was like, check these out. And he's really happy about it because he wants to see the program stay at his school. So getting these numbers really, really kind of helped us out. Okay, so um, like Andy was saying at the beginning, we get highlighted for the work that we do with youth, uh, just because everybody likes looking at little kids meditating or doing some mindfulness practices. But honestly, we try to deliver these services to any underserved community that doesn't have access to mindfulness practices or yoga. Uh, as you can see, uh, we do substance abuse classes, mental health. We, we, do, uh, we facilitate practices at mental illness facilities, uh, elderly homes. Uh, you know, we just try to do the gamut. We just try to really help out any underserved community that doesn't have access to these tools. So I'm sure a lot of y'all know the benefits of mindfulness, but still here, here they are. Uh, and these are the main ones we deal with in terms of anger management with kids, self-regulation, that control. Uh, um, Sir Harry was saying about, about that control, about knowing that you're in control. You know, and so often we see that with kids when we have two kids fighting and then we break them up and their hearts beating out their chest, and you say to them, do the breath. Put your hand on your heart and do the breath, and the child can feel their heart slowing down, feel their body changing. And it's like that little light bulb's like, bloop, like, whoa. A lot of times they say, thank you, and I'm like, don't, I didn't do anything. You're the one breathing. You know, you're in control. And that realization that I don't need to take this pill to calm me down, or I don't need this drug, or this and that. I don't need it outside external stimuli for me. It's about within me. And, and, and then for them to realize that at such a young age, I wish someone taught me that when I was a young guy, man, because like I said, I was out at the bar partying with these guys, you know what I mean? So, so that's the thing, it's really just being able to control yourself and then by, by knowing that inner peace and that control, then you're not as impulsive. Then it's not a kid pushes me and I immediately push him back. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> you know? It, it, it's not about reacting, it's about responding to what, the, what happened. It's about taking that pause, that gap, that space, and understanding that, hey, what am I getting out of this? And that's when they really start changing and then starting to walk that same path of the mindfulness. Uh, just a couple tips for um, working with mindfulness with youth. Uh, I mean, I guess with anybody. First place, come from a place of love. Um, kids feel it and it resonates with them, and if you come from that place of love, they, they see you as a resource and a place that they can go to and turn to. Um, I love that Sir Harry talked about hugs because that's we're huge huggers. Um, like, it doesn't matter. We go out, we walk out of a meeting at a foundation and give everybody hugs. So yeah. we're all about the hug. Actually, our teacher told us she's supposed to give 30 hugs, give or receive 30 hugs a day. So we try to reach that mark every day. So come from a place of love, seriously. Like, yeah. 
Y'all better watch out. Bring them in. Bring them uh -huh. in after this. <laughs> so, yeah, come from a place of love. The kids see you as a resource. They're not getting it in a lot of, or particularly a lot of kids in underserved, I guess everywhere, because we work in private schools and underserved communities, and they're not getting enough love. They don't hear about it enough. They, they don't, but when they, they feel it and they kind of get attracted to it, so if you come from that place of love, they'll see you as a resource. They'll want what you have, and then they see you modeling it, and they'll start to model it as well. So come from a place of love. Be present. Um, I guess just like uh, being a human, you know, you deal with a lot of different things that will make you have like those ruminating thoughts. And if you are teaching mindfulness, you have to be present. So it's really good to have your own practice to make sure that you're always present. And, you know, one thing we always tell our teachers is before you're going into a program, do some mindfulness, get your, get your breathing correct or do some specific breathing exercises to kind of make you more mindful and more present. And, you know, that helps you. Yeah. The saying we like to always say is that we're called human beings but we're never being. We should be called human doings because we're always doing stuff. We're never just present in the now. You know, it's always worried about what's going on and what had gone on in the past or what's going what, what's to come in the future instead of just being present in this one moment. You know, one thing we noticed the other night, we were hanging out and um, we were out, we were out at a bar and uh, we, we noticed that the three of us were the only people on our cell phones. You know what I mean? I'm not sure if that's an American thing or what, but no one else in there, were, everyone else was in there engaged and they were talking. We were the only people in the bar on our cell phones, like looking down. Yeah. It was like, everywhere like we went, felt it was bad, like put them in our pockets. Horrible, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So great job over here, you all. <laughs> have your own mindfulness practice. Um, this is another one where, again, you gotta, you have to model it when you're going out places, especially in some of these tougher neighborhoods, you know what I mean, where the kids are gonna be kind of like, I'm not doing this, man kiss my ass kind of that's the, that's the attitude they have you know and you have to have your own practice not only so you can deal with what they're going to be coming at you with and not react and not get angry or frustrated or let their stress leak off onto you but mainly it's for they know that you, that you're doing it you know so if, if you don't do it and you don't have your own practice the kid's gonna look at you like man you don't even do this why am i doing it you know what i mean so you got to make sure you really really embody and live it and it's kind of like michael was saying earlier we can talk about it and talk about mindfulness and the more you talk about it it's kind of pulls you away from it just the experience of it is really what it's about okay. yeah all right um don't be tied to your results um there's been plenty of times that we have walked into a class that we looked in it one way we would think we had failed um, and just be okay with that. Um, if you go in there and do the work, that's what you're there to do. You go in, you present the information, you model mindfulness like Andy was talking about, and you give them the tools, something's going to stick. It might not look the way you want it to look. It's probably never going to look the way you want it to look. And if it does look the way you want it to look, something's wrong, probably, because <laughs> I can't say that we've ever walked into a room and taught and it's gone the exact way that we wanted to go. But the kid, something sticks. Something's going to resonate with somebody. You give them a lot of different school skills, a lot of different tools. We always talk about having a toolbox. You give them a toolbox, something in there is going to work for them, and they're going to stick with it, and it's going to resonate with them, and they're going to use it probably for the rest of their lives. So don't get tired. Of you're just going to stress yourself out, and you're going to worry. You're going to doubt yourself as a teacher. So just see yourself as kind of like, I'm here to do the work, and that's it. I don't care about the results. Well, whatever happens, happens. And it'll make your life a lot happier. I remember uh, one example of that. Uh, there was this one little girl in our program that uh, – it's kind of related to us, uh, like one of the older guys in our neighborhood that kind of looked out for us as youngsters, it's his uh, niece. And man, she was never engaged in the practice. And you know, so much so that I saw her grandmother uh, in our community and I went up to her and I'm like, hey, uh, do you think that you can talk, her name was Anaje. I was like, do you think you can talk to Anaje? Like, we're trying to offer her some great skills that can help her deal with the chaos of you know, living in the city, living in the hood. And she's not really taken to the practice at all. Is there something that you can do to kind of motivate her to be engaged? And she looked at me, she's like, Atman. I was like, are you sure about that? Because I came in the house the other day with a stomach ache and she told me, grandma, come sit down next to me. And she taught, she taught her a breathing exercise that we taught in the actual uh, program. But even though she was never engaged, she was absorbing all of it, you know what I mean? So that, once again, just do the work and you never plant that seed and you, know, you never know when it's gonna grow, but eventually it will. Make it practical. All right, um, so in regards to this, uh, when we teach at elementary schools, the kids have a lot more energy. And before they can actually sit down and do some breathing and do some silent reflection, we gotta burn off their energy. So we do a lot of yoga, a lot of asanas, and a lot of different um, 
you know, different practices kind of to get that movement going, to get that restless energy out of their system so they can sit down, do the breathing, and do the silent reflections or meditations. Um, but when they get old, when kids get older, like when they're in high school, if you try to roll out their mat and kind of make them do the practices in their nice clothes that they're wearing in school to try to impress their friends, they ain't doing it. So you have to really be practical with your audience and give them tools that they will actually use. Like when we deal with high schoolers, it's more about the discussions that is very impactful to them, uh, the breathing techniques, and the different meditations. So really, like Ali was saying, you really have to diversify your toolbox because you just can't give everybody the same tools. Yeah, and we do uh, chair classes. So we do an entire class and we go to an elderly home or a drug rehab center where they've beaten up their bodies. We don't do anything on the mats. Everything's out of a chair. And we can do physical activities and everything just to make it easier and more practical so then they can start incorporating it into their everyday scenarios, whether they're on a bus or they're in front of their desk. And they're like, I, I don't have time for that. I don't have time. You know, people always say, I don't have time for that. So we try to make it so you do, you're, you are able to have time for that because we'll make it very, very practical. Yeah. Problem students. Yeah, I don't have any here. We can probably skip that slide. <laughs> no. um, number one tech trick with us when we deal with problem students, and I always know, right when I walk into a class and there's the one kid who's screaming, he's yelling, he's disruptive, I bring him up and he's my teacher, he's my assistant. Main reason is he wants attention anyways. That's why he's acting that way, right? And it never seems to fail. It always happens. He's up there and he's feeling all good now, like I'm in class. Yeah, I'm like, this, we're going to do the breath. He's like, all right. And he's doing it, and then after a while, some of the kids would be disruptive and a look at me, he's like, man, they're not listening to me. <laughs> ah, really? <laughs> Interesting. How's that feel, buddy, huh? You know what I mean? And it's like, again, light bulb, like, oh, and it's like, yeah, that's kind of what you were doing earlier, you know? And then we, we, do, we do it where, then when they're in the classroom, they have to be good students as well, because if you're not a good student, then we won't pull you up to be the teacher, you know? So, but that, that initial phase, you see the ones that are acting up a little, Pull them up to the front, and it's amazing the results you'll have with that. Uh, always make it fun. Um, our students are always laughing. They're always having a good time. You don't want it to be, you don't want mindfulness to be seen as like a, some type of punishment. So if you make it fun, they'll always go back to it, and they'll love coming to you. Like uh, when we go into some schools, the teachers use, their, their punishment actually is you can't go to the Holistic Life Foundation program today because they know how much they love it, and it's that much fun. So, yeah, make it fun. You, you'll be surprised at what it does for the kids. Yeah, our teacher used to always say to us that if our class wasn't laughing, then we're not doing anything right, that you're always supposed to have a good time. I remember we were in New York. He actually said, if your class ain't laughing, then you ain't doing shit. That was his exact <laughs> <laughs> uh, So we're, we're in New York, and there was, uh, it, we taught a, a class to a bunch of adults. And at the end, you know, we're laughing, we're having a good time. It's not serious. You know, every, all the other classes, it's like this quiet and this... You know, back super straight, it was almost like militant. And ours were always just relaxed and hanging out, having fun. And this lady comes up to me at the end. She said, wow, that was really great. I really enjoyed myself. And I could see how that would work with kids. Do you do something different with adults? We're like, nope, not at all. <laughs> no. and we, so having fun and making people laugh. And I'm glad you all are laughing, too, because it's showing this is what we like. This is what it's about. Use pop culture. Um, I know when we first started, like 13 years ago, nobody knew what yoga or mindfulness was. But honestly, right now, it's getting infused in all types of pop culture, whether it be like, at, like uh, in the States, um, the, the, the champion of the um, Super Bowl or the football, American football was a guy or uh, was from a team, Seattle Seahawks, and they had a mindfulness practice. And they really tried to highlight that on, was it Sports Illustrated? ESPN, ESPN, magazine. ESPN magazine. And on the front of it, it's him sitting, you know, in the easy pose, you know, zen and out or whatever. And it's really an easy way to be able to get kids uh, sold on the practice is using these things in pop culture. Whoever, like y'all can, I know Andy does this all the time when, you know, a kid says, well, I don't do mindfulness. It's, it's you know, it's not manly enough for me or, or something like that. He'll pull up his cell phone and like, all right, who, who is your favorite uh, athlete? And then he'll Google the athlete and say, you know, say it's uh, LeBron James. Just say LeBron James and mindfulness or yoga. And it'll be LeBron James sitting and meditating. You know what I mean? So that's one of our best tools is using pop culture to be able to sell uh, the practice to the students. 
So I know we're going over a little, so we're going to try to go through these real quick. Um, this is just kind of like what we talked about before with just engaging the principal, engaging the teachers, engaging the staff. That's how you're going to get it to work in the school. If you just go and you're just doing the stuff with the kids the whole time, then, and, and there's that animosity kind of from teachers, like you're taking away from my time, or the principal isn't the bond, you got to make sure you take care of them first almost. So this is Ali with the principal of the Mindful Moment School. And every day, every once a week, he would go there and have a session just with him. And that's when it really started, the buy-in started happening. And he's our number one champion to where if a teacher's like, I don't want to do this, he's like, no, nah, you don't understand. This is what is going on. We're doing this. It changed his life. He says he does it with his kids now. So you really got to make sure you grab them so that everyone will be involved. Um, some cool stuff coming up uh, later this year. I guess the coolest thing is uh, we're, we're working on this app called Will Grow. Um, it's through Will Concepts. It'll be out, uh, I guess, at some point next month. It's a, yeah, it's coming yeah. up quick. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool app. Uh, you be on your smartphone. You click, um, click on the app. It's uh, for teens first. You would click um, relationships or being present or stress or depression or sleep or athletics or, or any of these different topics. And like five or ten mindfulness practices would come up. You stick your earbuds in it, leads you through the practice. So we're really excited about that. A um, bunch of other stuff coming up, but that's what we're most excited about, I think for the rest of this year. And we're trying to hurry up through the slides, so. Yeah. <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's the last one. All right, boom, that was perfect. Yeah, so we're gonna we're do questions with the, uh, with the panel. Um, so you all can ask any questions and please feel free at lunch to come up to us and ask us for everything. And you know, thank you all so much for your time. And, and just remember one thing we like to always say, love is the most powerful force in the universe, y'all. We love all y'all. Thank you so much.